Um, just actually, I, so I've never been to India before. I'm not familiar with your development community. Um, can you guys tell me? I, I'm curious what size of companies you're working with. Um, can, can, can you raise your hand if you work for a company that's 10 people or less? Okay, all right, cool. Um, how about 100 people or less? All right, so bigger companies. So 500 people or less? All right, all right, now we'll get some All right, and then like, okay, like 2,000 people or less. All right, how about oh, over 2,000 people? Okay, all right. Well, it'd be interesting. I mean, it sounds like there's definitely some larger companies represented in the room, and, and these ideas, you know, with larger companies sometimes are really interested in this sort of thing, and sometimes it's hard to get ideas started in, in, in bigger companies. Um, regardless, you know, obviously, I think it's worth worth thinking about and worth considering. Um, so, a little bit about my story. I'm from the U.S. I live in Chicago. Um, and actually, from 1996 to 2000, I was a I was a family therapist. That was my previous career. Uh, I got my undergrad and master's degree in uh, psychology and, and, and family therapy, and I worked with troubled kids. Um, but then, in 1999, I, I learned HTML and kind of got into web development that way through the front end, and then worked my way back um, to eventually Pearl when I joined a little startup near Chicago. Um, and I uh, had to learn Perl to keep my job. I, I was kind of a, a writer and an HTML um, developer, I guess you could say. And uh, they needed me to learn Perl, so I did as quickly as I could, because I had a wife and a kid, and I needed to put food on the table. So I had a lot of incentive. A couple years later, um, I ran into a book called Software Crash, which is a book by Keith McRae that was written, I think, in 1999. So, um, and it just kind of it introduced some concepts to me that were helpful. I, I, like I said, I don't have like a formal education in, in software development or computer science or software engineering. Um, and this book, Software Craftsmanship, gave me a, just a small vocabulary to help me understand kind of where I stood. I couldn't really, I didn't feel like I was a computer scientist at that point. You know, I was basically a web developer, self-taught. I, didn't, I couldn't really feel like I could call myself an engineer either, but I felt like I could call myself an apprentice because that's that's what it, I mean. It introduced the concepts of apprentice, journeyman, and master, which uh, I finally felt like I could label myself with something, which was helpful. Um, and it was I think it was super helpful to be able to say I'm an apprentice, which helped me understand that I still had a long way to go, even though you know at that point I was like a senior application developer at this little company I was working at. Um, it made me realize, well, there's all sorts of much, much better people and much, much better companies in the world that I should be kind of aspiring to. Um, so as the years progressed, um, I got out of that company and got a got my big break by working for ThoughtWorks, um, which for me was, I worked really hard in order to make that happen. I, I read a lot and I started paying my way to go to like Agile conferences in the United States. Um, and eventually convinced them to hire me. Um, and while I was there, I uh, started writing about apprenticing. Um, ThoughtWorks is a great company. Does anyone here, here work for ThoughtWorks? I use them. Yeah, okay, me too. <laughs> um, anyway, so I mean, ThoughtWorks has a lot of great people in it. Uh, that's one of its biggest assets, obviously, is people. Um, and so I was able to actually interview a lot of people there about their experiences becoming software developers kind of um, compared that and contrasted that to my experience from becoming a software developer and tried to create some patterns. So not like software design patterns, but like apprentice patterns. Like patterns that work for helping people who are trying to become software developers. Um, so I started writing about that in 2005. And then a couple years later, I actually stopped writing for a little while when Ruby got exciting in the, in the US. And put, you know, put, that, put my writing away for a little while because there were some big opportunities to take advantage of Ruby and Ruby on Rails in the US. Um, and left ThoughtWorks and joined a little company called Optiva um, in Chicago and, uh, in 2006. And then in 2007, um, we kind of landed our first Ruby project and uh, 
my first um, instinct was to go and find an apprentice to help help me, basically. Because um, I knew that there's people out look kind of like me out there um, who probably knew how to program, or probably didn't have any credentials, and just needed a kind of a, a break, or like a, a, uh, an opportunity to kind of get up to the next level. Um, so anyway, that program, we did that a number of times over the years, and grew, and grew an apprenticeship program between 2007 and 2012. Along the way, we got acquired by Groupon. Um, in, uh, in Chicago um, and, and got to bring the apprenticeship program there and grew it where it's still going. Uh, that's the book I wrote. It, it did eventually get pu published in 2009 um, and it's actually uh, available online for free. Uh, if you just Google apprenticeship patterns, I think the first link is actually the, the open like Creative Commons link to it. It's all in HTML. But it's also like on Kindle and all that good stuff. And like I said, this, and this is not a this is not a book for people who want to create apprenticeship programs. This is a book for new software developers, basically kind of a career guide, um, guidance for the aspiring software craftsmen. So that was published a few years ago, and thankfully, it's not a book that goes out of date quickly. I'm kind of lazy. I don't like I don't like writing lots of books, so I chose a topic that uh, that doesn't go out of date, or at least has a relatively long half life. Anyway, um, so just my like basically what what why apprenticeship, right? Why why do I think this is a, a topic worth talking about? Why do I think this is uh, something worth investing time and resources in? Um, and some of I mean, and I've given this talk a couple times, both times in the U.S. So I'm not sure how well it fits here. So you guys need to interrupt me and, and tell me like no, that doesn't quite work. But um, or if it does work, just kind of nod your heads a little bit. But um, in the U.S. at least, and I'll probably keep putting that in context, uh, our mainstream hiring models are too narrow. And by that I mean employers you know, see a need that they have, they write a job description, it's got a bunch of like, you know, uh, skills on there, very, probably very specific acronyms and things like that. And then they can't fill it and then they complain about not being able to find anybody. Um, and that happens a lot in the US. There's, um, as you'll see in the later slide, there's a lot of un un unemployment, underemployment, um, <coughs> and yet there's lots of jobs going unfilled. Um, I don't know if that's the case here. But um, I, a lot of that is because employers have like too narrow job descriptions for, the, for, their, for their entry level, or for, yeah, for their entry level jobs. And people have this problem, I assume is worldwide, which is they can't get their first job, and to get their first job, they need to have some experience. And so in order to get that experience, you need that first job. Um, and because of all the online resources and tools that are basically free or cheap, uh, assuming you have an internet connection and a computer, there's people out there who, can, who are learning to code, you know, that, that, they, that, that can, you, you can hire that don't necessarily have like a ton of that don't have a great credential, um, but they have a lot of potential, and, and they have the ability to code at this point. So I don't know what the number is, but there's untold thousands of what we call high potential, low credential, underemployed people available, and they already know how to code. Because, I mean, 2012 was kind of a big year um, for online learning, for, for software development, for coding. Um, things like Team Treehouse and CodeAcademy.com things like that, um, made it easier than ever for people to kind of level up on their own relatively cheaply. Um, and so, th so there's just a lot of people out there that maybe they don't fit the usual job description, maybe they don't have the right credentials in general, but, um, but, they, have, but, but they have the potential to be great contributors in your, in your, on your team if given the right structure. One, uh, yeah. So one of one of the other reasons that apprenticeship works really well is because you're growing people into your culture, um, as opposed to just finding people and kind of jamming them in already pre-made, which you have to do to a certain extent when you're hiring more senior people. Um, the nice thing about apprentices is they grow up in your culture. It's kind of like a child being raised in a family, and they just kind of, for the most part, 
fit into that family. Um, it's a little bit like that. Um, and it actually engenders a lot of loyalty um, when, you, when it's done right, as you'll see in some statistics that I gathered about um, re like retention of apprentices over the years. Um, and then it seeds a culture of learning. Apprentices, their, their biggest responsibility is their own learning. Um, and that tends to infect the people around them, and it tends to be a good influence on the more se senior people in the room or on their team, um, who are maybe a little more jaded or tired or whatever, or, just, or stressed or whatever, and the apprentices come in and they're learning, and that tends to create a culture of learning because they're hungry for knowledge. So how does it work? Um, let's get into that a little bit. Um, I think one of the fundamental, basically the fundamental structure in an apprenticeship is someone who's willing to mentor, right? An experienced, a relatively experienced practitioner. They don't have to be like an architect or like the, the, the best software developer in, in the team, but they need to be experienced. They can't be un, like a, a, a beginner themselves. Um, and so they, and they need to be willing to mentor. That's not, those, those two things don't always coexist, right? Sometimes there's somebody who's good at, who's an experienced practitioner, but they prefer to, to just be a team leader or something like that and not necessarily bother with beginners. Um, that, that person needs to be on a team and, and working on a project that's within reach of the apprentice. And by that I mean, and that, that kind of is an opportunity to find what I'm talking about when I say apprentice. I'm not talking about somebody who doesn't know anything. I'm basically talking about the way, we, the way we approached it was, let's find somebody who's within six months of our entry level requirements. Right? What we normally be looking for for an entry level hire, let's, let's take that push it back six months, and that's the kind of people that we're looking for. So, I mean, our first apprentice is definitely already knew how to code. They just didn't have the cred or the or the, or the um, reputation yet to get hired as an entry level, or the or the yeah the credentials or the reputation. So the project needs to be within reach, meaning the, the apprentice within six months or actually within two months should be able to start being a contributor on the project. So. If it's, if it's a very, very specific domain, well, you're probably going to want to find people who don't have the ability to code super well yet, but probably understand the domain to a certain extent. Um, another, another way that it works um, is that it's, and then Eric is part of my philosophy towards this, is by emphasizing culture over curriculum. So as people, when people get excited about apprenticeship and wanting to put a pr program together, often what they'll do is uh, is um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, they'll get really excited about putting a curriculum together, right? All their favorite books and all the right things to you know work on and checklists of, of skills and things like that, which is good. But often they'll delay even starting bringing an apprentice on while they're putting all that together. I often think that's overkill. If you have the ability to put that together, you can probably put it together on the fly when you actually have an apprentice with you. Um, and I think better use of time. Is to focus on like creating, creating your, your existing culture and cultivating that. Um, and ultimately, what you want is a, I mean, a, cult, a culture is going to adapt and survive and, and grow people, whereas a curriculum is going to get out of date really quickly. Um, anyway, next, uh, contributing in the trenches um, is is a really is, is another fundamental right there with having a mentor. Um, if, if you know. If the apprenticeship goes by and it's been six months and the person isn't a, a, a contributor in the trenches, like painting on the project, um, then it, it's not really a successful apprenticeship to me. Um, by the end of the apprenticeship, they should be a, a, a productive teammate, a productive team member, and almost indistinguishable from, from anybody else. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, Basically, to the point where it would it would hurt to lose them, right? Uh, generally, in my in my experience, that after about two months, people are able to be productive, and, and your investment is at least starting to pay off a little bit. Um, another 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 important aspect of how it works is having a pet project. So they're 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 spending some of their time in the trenches on the team, being a contributor, pair programming. Um, I think that was some feedback. <laughs> um, 
Um, but the another really important place is to have a have a, a safe uh, pet project for the for the apprentice to work on, um, where it's their own independent work. They get to choose the the technology. They get to choose the application. Um, and this is a this is an opportunity to for them to to kind of make mistakes in a safe place as opposed to like on production code, which is what they're working on in the trenches. And then. And then the critical thing that we've learned over the years is having structured feedback loops at multiple levels. When we first started our first apprentice, there weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of feedback loops other than just pair programming and, and having a relationship between me and our first uh, apprentices. But we started adding structure over time. Um, and ended up, ended up nowadays with a structure that has multiple levels, um, like I like I alluded to here, where. And the, the, the biggest the biggest feedback loop is six months, um, and that's basically if the apprentice can't make it as an entry level uh, software developer within six months, then it's not really going to work out, right? So, and that's and that's the relationship is structured in such a way that we're kind of in or out at that point. And that's the biggest feedback loop. The next level in is two two month milestones basically. Um, every two months. There's a milestone meeting where the apprentice comes and does a demo of their of their pet project, um, a code review of their pet project, a retrospective on how the last two months have gone. Uh, they they present a topic that they learned about for five to ten minutes. Um, that sort of activity, and then in, in the room are five to ten more senior people who are kind of involved or there for they're there for feedback. Um, to just kind of be involved in the apprentice's growth, and at that meeting, there's a decision made whether they're going to continue, whether they're going to, whether they're, it's not working out and they're done, or whether we're going to hire them right there. <coughs> and that happens three times, right, every two months. And then inside the two months, <coughs> there's there's weekly meetings with the mentor, um, and, and the, the apprentice isn't necessarily spending all day every day pairing with their mentor. They, they might not even necessarily be on the mentor's team for a week or two during this time, but the is definitely on the hook for meeting with them once a week, just, just to see how things are going. So that's that's the feedback loops that we've incorporated over time. So some of the results we've seen from this, and I, I gathered this from Optiva, which was the, the consultancy that I that was a, I was a partner at, that was bought by Groupon, and there's two other apprenticeship programs that I asked for numbers from, HashRocket, which is a, another US-based consultancy, and A-Flight, which is, at this point, probably is the biggest apprenticeship program that I'm aware of. Um, these all have presence in Chicago and also HashRock has an office in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, from these three, this is this, I gathered these last summer. From these three or four programs, there's been 58 apprentices that have gone through over the years. 80% of those apprentices are still, oh, skip, skip one. But anyway, 80% of the, the apprentices that successfully completed their apprenticeship are still with the company. Um, 54 out of the 50, 58 succeeded. Oh yeah, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what anti-patterns have you seen really uh, by actually putting uh, work in, I mean, working in trenches? Uh, have you seen any anti-patterns there? Yeah. Uh, uh, so if you would elaborate on yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first anti, I mean, and, and of course I was the instigator of these anti-patterns. <laughs> and it's part of the learning process. but. The first anti-pattern was well, our first apprentice that we brought on. It was it was a big success. He, he was um, he learned very very quickly. He was a pro programmer that came in and learned Ruby like it felt instantaneously. And so we quickly brought on like two or three more apprentices over the next four or five months. And that was definitely an anti-pattern because um, if the ratio gets screwed up between junior and senior people on a team. You end up with apprentices pairing with apprentices yeah. in the trenches, <laughs> and that's not what you want, right? So, one of the definitely one of the things we've learned, I guess, an anti -pat or a pattern is not 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 going past a one to one ratio of junior to seniors on a team, and the anti pattern would be the, the opposite, letting letting hiring too many apprentices at once, getting over eager um, in that way. So that that's definitely that's definitely hurt, and and, and that that first apprentice that we had left after about a year because he wasn't being mentored the way he wanted to, like the way he was expecting, because, because there was these new apprentices that came in to our attention. Um, so, is that a, does that answer your question? 
Yeah. Okay. Um, try to think of some other examples. Um, the, the reason why I asked because yeah. uh, I'm doing a very similar thing and uh, a bunch of six, five to six grads. So five to six grads? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight out of school and we are doing exactly project from the trenches. Got it. We open sourced it last couple of weeks back. So that's that's exact scenario of so kind of trying to relate. Is there is there a pattern on? Maybe we can share offline later on. Okay. I mean, I will say that there's uh, there's there's a guy at Hash Rocket named Shay Arnett who did something. Maybe it's a little bit like what you're doing. And, he, and it's actually, I would say, for a lot of cases, what he's doing is an anti-pattern. But he's making he made it work, where he, he brought on three apprentices at once. And they sold, and, and, but they also let the, the client know what they were building the software for, that this is going to be rather than a reduced rate. This is a team of a very senior person with three junior people on it. And it was all very open and clear about what was going on. And, and, he, and he had a structure where he just rotated every two hours, so he paired with all the apprentices every day. That's exactly what I do. And it, and it, uh, it worked. It worked. It's just, it's hard to find mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. mentor. Mm -hmm. It's hard to find a client who's open to that. Mm -hmm. but, it yeah, can, it can work. It's just not. Yeah, it, it just takes away my hundred percent of the time. That's that's. What you say? It, it takes away hundred percent of my time. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's not necessarily sustainable. I mean, after that project, he was like done for a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I. <laughs> Which it was a great, you know, it's, so it's great for everybody probably, but not necessarily a sustainable model. Yeah. Um, so yeah, eighty percent. I was, you know, I was very happy to, to see that. You know, obviously, I had a sense for that from our own. Um, numbers in terms of people sticking around, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and that that that's generally surprising to people because they, you know, the skeptics naturally will be like, well, the, okay, the apprentices can stick around for a year and then take off with this new knowledge, and, and now they're now they've established themselves. But generally, if if they've received the mentoring that they kind of came for and they felt they don't feel taken advantage of, they will stick around. Um, and then, yeah, I've got starting salary on there. That's obviously just specific to those two cities. Um, and then age range, and like, across across all these 58 people, um, you know, 19 to 42. Um, one thing to note is, like, obviously most people who start their apprenticeship finish their apprenticeship. It's not necessarily like a maybe more typical weed-out program where you're bringing in a batch of people and you're going to see who survives, <laughs> who gets voted off the island and stuff. Um, this is generally, like the way, I, I guess the way I um, talk about it is, uh, it, it, often people ask the difference between internship and apprenticeship, and they're pretty, it's a blurry line for sure. But the way at least I look at it is, um, an internship is kind of like dating, where you don't necessarily have an intention of getting married. Right, like you know, in, in, during that during that time, so they might come and intern you, intern for you for a summer, and you're just kind of checking each other out, and then they're going to go off back to school or wherever. Um, whereas an apprenticeship is more like an engagement. Like you, if this isn't not, if this isn't not ended marriage or employment, then something went wrong. Um, so there's a lot of investment that goes in both directions in an apprenticeship, where the mentor is doubling, and the company's investing in the apprentice, and they're feeling that. And, and vice versa. Obviously, the apprentice is, is taking a lot of responsibility for them for their own learning and, and uh, mm -hmm. investing mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you handle the guys who did not meet the expectations? So, you know, 50, 50 or 50 so generally, the pattern. So obviously, most make it, but when they don't, it's you know it's relatively clear after the first two months that they're on, on the edge of not making. And so we can use those milestones as kind of a warning point for them, like a raise the red flag. Um, so <coughs> it's, it's very rare that somebody, we haven't seen it yet for me in my experience that somebody makes it like to month four and then all of a sudden they don't make it at month six. Um, so at month two, it's always, if, if someone's not gonna make it, it's kind of clear at that point and we'll give them a warning and <coughs> in the next milestone, some people you know, level up and, and, and make it, and then sail on to their third milestone and, and get, a, get a job. Um, and it, but a few times it has happened on the second milestone, it's like, yeah, okay, but still, you're still not there yet. 
and it's kind of clear from the pairing with them in the trenches that they're not contributing at the level that we expect for four months in, and then we have, we have to let them go. So, and that, and that, that was definitely something kind of plays and segues into this point, which is at the beginning we just hired them right off the bat, and apprenticeships didn't have these time boxes and things, and so they would kind of stretch them out in, in times you don't want to fire anybody. And if you didn't have any like set times to, to make a decision, you kind of there's always other things to do other than fire, like let people go. Um, and so for me, because I get attached to these apprentices and stuff, and I think most people do, having these decision points on the milestone days are important for like, for me, if, okay, I, I'm allowed to feel, I'm allowed to kind of be a jerk in this situation and be, be the bad guy because that's my responsibility. Um, so that was really helpful for me personally um, to have these scheduled decision points. I mentioned before, um, overall, like if, you know, if you have a team of, of 10 people, you don't want to have like seven of them be apprentices and three of them be senior in general especially if you're just starting this out. Um, so in terms of, you, you definitely don't want to go beyond a one-to-one -one ratio. And then also for the mentor in general, you want the mentor to have more than one apprentice, especially just when you're starting this out. Um, that, as people get more experience with it, there's definitely um, exceptions to these rules. But, um, but it, it takes years. Um, I would, I mean, one of the things we've learned, we, we, we went a little back and forth between having kind of a structured curriculum versus an organic, meaning like it's kind of happening on the fly from the mentor. Um, and we, we are towards the side of being kind of on the fly, um, just because this, app, this is over the course of years and, and the technology we were working with changed significantly. Um, and then the other lesson that we've learned is we, we haven't figured it out for many of populations other than white, white men like me. Um, that's just just looking across those 50 years ago, it was definitely overrepresented. Like white men in the U.S. were overrepresented. Um, so that's just kind of putting this in context. What are the quality that the apprentices puts in the mentor? You mentioned that some of them will leave because they don't get that right fundamental mentorship. So if an organization or someone who is running that program, what does he need to take in to make sure that the mentors are geared up and they know you know what kind of feedback or what kind of input they need to provide to the mentor? So you're talking about the qualities of a mentor? Quality is a focus area which a mentor <coughs> needs to look at and continue to uh, provide feedback to an apprentice to, uh, you know, to make him realize uh, the expectation or the goals. So I'm just... I'm so just what I'm saying is that when you, you have an apprentice who leaves because he didn't get right mentorship. So sure. when an apprentice joins an organization in such a program, what kind of mentorship will he expect? Right, okay. Yeah, well, the expectations, and, and that, that's definitely like the first week or two of the apprentice's time on the team is the most intense time in terms of the investment because the apprentice is disoriented, they have to kind of get up to speed, and they're, they've got kind of thrown into the deep end. And that's the time to set expectations. And so the apprentice should be able to expect a, a weekly check-in with their mentor. To, even if they're working every day with their mentor, it's important to be able to just sit down and just talk specifically about how things are going. So they should always have that. Um, if the mentor is out for a week, okay, maybe check in by email or something. But they should they should have that weekly check in, and if that's not happening, that then their, their expectations are not being met. Um, they also shouldn't be just kind of off in the corner by themselves all week. Um, they should be they should have the opportunity to pair with in the trenches, right? At the same time, they should have the opportunity to do some self study. Do some and work on their own their pet project. And during the beginning of the first two months of their apprenticeship, maybe that project time is taking up, um, you know, half of their kind of daylight hours. Over the course of the apprenticeship, that ratio slowly changes. So they're like probably moonlighting and doing their working on their pet project at night and spending more and more time in the trenches during the day because they can because they they've developed the ability to be a contributor. Um, so. Having that, and so that's important to make to a lot of apprentices to know that they have that breathing room, especially at first, to kind of sit, like be helpful or, or just try to shadow pair at first and then kind of back off and, and study a little bit. Does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Just, why don't they difference between, let's say I have a college, college graduate. Mm -hmm. 
I can do the same program for this also versus non-skilled or so passenger shakumar and non-engineering background can be trained to follow the right way. Versus yes. the college graduate, which is probably maybe has done some kind of a technology background also, can be mentored in this program. So I can have I a differentiation so, yeah. We, over time, I mean, like we were just like a four-person consultancy at first, and so um, we didn't get any like people that had CS degrees doing this. But over the time, as we kind of gained a little bit more prestige, we did, um, and they just you know the college grads just went through it faster, you know, or the I should think, everyone who went through it, I think, at least started college. Maybe they didn't finish, but um, but yeah, I should say the CS majors, the few that have gone through this program. They just did it in two months or four months at the outset, at the outside, um, as opposed to the full six months. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, my question was similar to what you know he was asking. Uh, so, like in <coughs> my group, uh, we get a people who are you know straight away coming from college. Uh, we recruit people you know they're later, so they are coming with some baggage. Yeah. And the kind of work environment we have, so we have to uh, enable them, we have to team them, you know, according to like what's our expectation. Now in that case, uh, the people who are coming with the baggage, you know, they try to get, you know, what's going on around and they might decide also that, you know, this is not my cup of tea, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking for that. And whereas if, if I'm, you know, bringing a person who is fresh graduate, you know, and bringing him on a board, the person might take, you know, one or one and a half year to understand what's going on. And then after that, the other person also can decide that it's not a cup of my tea. So, uh, I mean, where are things going wrong uh, first? And uh, I mean, what do you think that you know, where things going wrong? Second, uh, so the first question is like, how to how to handle when somebody exactly. finds out like mm, this is not really working for me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and and second is that you know, is there any frequency we see in coaching and mentoring? Because you know, if you look at the technology, so. Every two months, three months, four months, six months, you know, it's changing. And the person who are working on the project, they have to hop from one technology to another technology. So how that momentum should go on? So what's the frequency you're looking at? Because right now, uh, I mean, you just spoke about a six month window and every two months, you know, the milestone has to be right. touch based. And within two months, every week, mentors used to have, you know, meeting with the person and to see that what the person is doing. So, so what, sorry, what was the second question? So, so the second question is, uh, you know, what should be the frequency? It should be uh, ongoing process, or we just stop after six months and we leave that person as you know, uh, on his own to you know okay. to decide what to do next. Yeah, um, I'll get to that one a little bit. Uh, I mean, in general, though, what you're trying to do is obviously like they don't just like stop learning after six months. You, you want to have everybody in your organization learning new things. Uh, they just kind of lose some of the, the natural structure that or the structure that the apprenticeship program. Has. <coughs> Sorry, the, my, my memory is not great uh, right now. Uh, what was the first question? First question was, like when it's know. not working out. Yes. Um, you know, that did happen one... In general, it's not really an issue because because of the number of people that apply to these programs. Um, you, it's a, you tend to... Because it's there's a lot of people, obviously, that don't have credentials, um, to, in order to do this, you end up with a lot of applicants. And you, you can take, you know, you, you maybe end up with 20 applicants, and you can take the best one. Um, and so, in general, these people, and, and what you're screening for when you're screening for them are people that are already really motivated to do this, and they already know. They're not using this as a way of like figuring out whether they want to be a software developer. They've already decided, like, I want to be a software developer. Um, so, I mean, that 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 doesn't often happen, but when it does. Um, I mean, so I remember um, one person went through the program and definitely through the process realized that she enjoyed the product side of things more than the, the code side because she because she kept seeing like we might we might be writing good code but we're building the wrong stuff right and so she, she wanted to attack that problem. Um, I mean, for us that wasn't a big deal because we were a small company, so it was easy for us to kind of you know steer her in that direction. Or help her go in that direction. It's it's a little trickier in bigger companies like Groupon at this point, or some of the companies you guys work for, where I'm sure the roles are a little bit narrower in general. You know, we're like that'd be a little bit harder to to route them into the right role. Um, 
because you have people like multiple, typically more senior people in milestone meetings, generally there's people around that, that can kind of connect the dots. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so when you pick uh, probably 10 and then the key, and because of the party team size, you spread them into the team teams, obviously, because 10 need to be these large parties. Yeah. Um, and each product has its own technology need, and each product has a different set of people in their own families. And these 10 people also are future. Yep. And they have a different feeling over there as well. How do you address that problem? You know, I, to be honest, I haven't, had to, I haven't had to deal with that problem too much. Just because generally when, when we've been bringing on junior people, we bring them on one at a time, not in batches. I mean, I know that's not uncommon. Um, it's just not a problem that I have a lot of experience with. I mean, maybe oh. there's other people in the room that could help answer that question. But did you have something no. else to say? And some of the projects are maintenance projects. Mm -hmm. Some of the projects are building some exciting new projects. Yeah. Now all projects are created. Yeah. So, so when they go back and talk to their things, yeah. I mean, they're this whole motivation time. Yeah, it's directly into their money. It's cute. Anytime, yeah, anytime we've had apprentices that start relatively close to each other, or maybe even within a week of each other, there's always this tendency to compete, to compare each other, to even compare the projects they're working on. So we just try to avoid that. But I know it's all, I mean, there's certain situations where people just naturally batch up together. Any um, large companies, five hundred plus, yeah. do not pay two, five, right. they pay 15. Sure. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. <coughs> So one of the things that we tend to do is, is move them around so that you know they just don't get stuck in one single stream mm -hmm. that they clean up what you like. So if you have a VAU kind of work stream alongside pure development or pure QA kind of streams, then you tend to move people around. So the advantage is not, you know, the, the, the cream is not just shared by like a particular lot. And the second thing is they get a flavor of all the different streams that are you know, on the floor or in the organization. And we're very lot from beginning again. That's right, because people will talk at the apprentice level, they will talk as to what exactly I do up to, and this is what I'm getting. So if you have a, a program that, you know, is going to do justice to all, then that will work. That's, yeah, that's that's a great, that's a great point. Um, this is, I mean, the way that we've structured this, and in general, all these programs that I'm talking about structure it, is these people are getting paid well below, like, normal wages. And so they should be able to expect that sort of experience. They're, 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 they're taking that hit for, for the short term in order to get a great learning experience. So like being able to rotate on projects would be something that would probably be kind of a pain for the organization to deal with, but it's a good trade-off because you're, you're paying these people less for this time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Apprentice level. It's, it's, it's really customized. <coughs> That's just, and, and again, that, that's the way that I've done it. That's the way these, for these smaller, you know, consultancy oriented, like, you know, 50 person or less companies have done it. Um, I know, like, there's, you know, ThoughtWorks has their boot camp in Bangalore, and um, I'm sure that's much more structured. I'm sure it evolves a lot year to year. Um, anyway. So, my question was, based on technology needs or does it evolve? Like, have you seen it evolving per person? Like, because they're the individuals. Yeah, because they all come in with different experiences, you know. Um, so I, 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 basically, that's one of the reasons I kind of advocate to have it be on the fly because um, when you're not maybe bringing in people from a university, um, you can't necessarily, you don't necessarily know exactly what they're coming in with. It's, it's going to vary quite a bit. Um, but if you have you know mentors that are experienced and, and want and want to do this, they generally know the resources to point people at, you know, to fill in the gaps. Yeah. And does it also affect the evaluation of the six months or Yeah. Well, to, I mean, the nice thing about being a, a, a contributor in the in the trenches and in this sort of program is that the evaluation really at the end of the six months is are they 
are they a good teammate? You can just evaluate them. It's like a six month in interview basically. Um, where you're not, you don't necessarily need to look at some inventory necessarily. You can just say, are they productive on our team? And have they met, would we hire them at an entry level at this point? Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's definitely, I mean, not all projects, I mean, yeah. It, it, sometimes you can get a little bit too focused on, are they productive on this project? And maybe they won't be able to switch to the next, but the rotation we were just talking about helps with that as well. We started doing that a little bit. As we got into a bigger company like Groupon, the apprentice could switch to a different project for two months. Yeah. What do we need to get them up to speed? What else is there? Because we have a scenario, we need to get them up to speed very quickly. We don't have much time. You need to get them up to speed. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we need to get them productive. <laughs> Um, I mean, one of the things that we started doing really early was having weekly, like, lunch and learn sort of situations where, like, the senior, the, one of the mentors or the mentors would take turns giving a talk once a week over lunch. Um, so, and that, that's another opportunity to talk about things that you can see that the apprentices are, are missing. Um, and you can introduce, introduce more advanced concepts to them that they don't necessarily get by just coding and pair programming. Um, so that's, that's definitely, I don't know how prevalent that is here. Uh, it's definitely like a kind of unspoken practice that happens in the U.S. a lot is um, companies gathering over, you know, all the engineers at a company gathering over lunch once a week and, and people either come in from the outside uh, as invited guests or people in the company also end up and give a talk. Um, so that that's one way. I mean, I, you know, like I'm definitely an advocate of most of the or all of the XP practices, and I think they tend to accelerate learning this um, Pair programming is is, is a tricky one, though, right? Because if you have this time pressure, it, it means you're slowing somebody more, so you're down for a while. Um, but it's a, but it's it's an investment um, that you're going to see get, get back later. I mean, when you have you know, several productive, <coughs> um, affordable, loyal developers who, you know, a year a year previously weren't very productive at all. It's 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 easy to see that it was worth the investment to pair. Um, but yeah, there's, there's there's not a lot of easy answers. I mean, apprenticeship is a more long term investment. Um, so I mean, it, so that's that's why it's good if you can to hire people who enjoy the mentoring because it tends to if they're into that sort of thing and they enjoy it, it tends to slow them down less as they're doing it. You know, as the, as the mentor is, is, is pairing with them. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. I appreciate your questions, let's keep it coming. Um, so I, I, I'm a psych major, and so I, I like thinking about people and, and the relationships between people. Um, and one of the things um, I've been thinking about that kind of helped me understand why um, things worked out pretty well at Optiva, was thinking about it, the fundamental thing that, that kind of is the framework for this line of thinking is the competency continuum. If, if you could, possibly, if you can't, but if you could, put software development or any sp specific um, tech skill on a, on a straight line, meaning uh, people who are incompetent are over here on the left and very, very competent people are over on the right. Um, it's helpful to me to think about, especially when you're in the concept, in, in the, when you're thinking about bringing on apprentices, it's helpful for, me, helpful for me to kind of put organizations or teams on this continuum. Um, so here'd be a, here, here, for example, here'd be a, t a team or a, a, small, a small company with four people who are relatively junior, all working together. Um, and and this, is, this would not be a great case for apprenticeship. Right? This would not be a great situation for, for this company to, to bring a, like somebody junior on, because they're already relatively junior, and they're just trying to figure things out themselves. Um, there's also cases where you have, like this would be maybe a, a stereotypical like high-end consultancy, um, where you have all these people over here on the right side of the continuum who probably can bill out at high rates, things like that, but they're, but they're all kind of clustered around the same senior level of competency. And, and uh, 
definitely talk to people and, and, and work with companies and help them start apprenticeship programs so you have that sort of um, that sort of distribution and it's really hard for apprentices to, to or for them to get started because they're going to try to bring someone on over here and then there's just there's just this huge gap between the apprentice and these people in terms of the language like the, like these people will speak in a, basically a foreign language to the, to, to the apprentice over here it's really the only gee, the only way for for these people to to kind of move into apprenticeship is to hire somebody like here right who's close who's, who's kind of close to their language to, to their to their competency and slowly work them work their way back um, which which would take a long time they're probably never going to lose that kind of senior cluster of people um, but it's just it's, it was just helpful for me to, to realize like why this kept like a company like with that profile kept kind of failing to start an apprenticeship program um, we, we just kind of happened into a structure a little bit like this at Optiva where we tended to start towards the middle when we started as a company in 2006 um, and we hired more senior people and we brought on and we hired more junior people and we just ended up with this interesting spread of competency where we had very junior people and we had very very senior people and, and everybody in between and, and people would come in one of, one of you guys asked about what happens kind of at the end of the apprenticeship right like like, to, like they need to keep learning they need to learn new technologies and learn you know as, as new projects come up and when you have a situation like this where you have this nice spread um, that tends to just keep happening because uh, there's there's people right right ahead of you that you can kind of model yourself after um, and there's obviously a lot of things you, you need to do and can do to create a, a culture of learning but um, one of the one of the ways that works and kind of the magic that, that I felt um, when, when I, in, in this sort of structure comes because there's this concept of zone of proximal development. Like all of us in this room, for all the different things we're good at or, or want to become good at, have, the, have a, a zone of, of, of development where, um, and this is human development or like knowledge acquisition, things that are available to us next, right? Um, Ask, you know, certain aspects of for specific, like if we're looking at a programming language, like becoming a better programmer, there's certain aspects of a programming language and features of a programming language that are available to you next. And then once you, once you acquire those, you know, now your zone has moved forward. Um, so if you think of this as a person and this is their zone, if there's, if there's someone just ahead of you that's in your zone, they're in a great position to, to, to pair with you and work with you and talk with you and help you acquire the knowledge in this zone um, and so the magical thing that I that we kind of stumbled into at Optiva in my opinion was the fact that we had this kind of link and chain situation going on where there was never a situation where anybody was too far out ahead of the next person and there was always somebody kind of in your zone who could help you out and this is an important kind of bit to the mentor uh, the mentoring aspect of, of the apprenticeship where maybe this is an apprentice and their mentor is up here and, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the mentor is the one that's teaching them everything and that, 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 the, that the apprentice is learning everything from the mentor often it reminded me of when I was learning martial arts and there was definitely a black belt around and that's kind of who I was paying for my instruction but often when I was a white belt I was learning from yellow belts the yellow belts were the ones, or the orange belts were the ones that were helping me get up to the next level and give me like the practical um, lessons. Um, and that's because they, you know, they, they knew my language, they knew what it felt like to be a beginner. They were just there maybe a few months before that. Um, and so this, this is just something um, that we kind of stumbled onto and just thinking back and looking at it made a lot of sense to me. And, and, and it just, and I, I mentioned it just because when you're thinking about bringing people on and hiring people, um, you might go just going back to this for a second. You might, you might, your team might be here, and you're like, well, we need to bring on some junior people, or we need to bring on some really senior people. But anytime you, you try to reach too far out ahead or too far back, you're creating these gaps, which end up hurting your culture because it, it just creates a lot of dissonance when when there isn't a, a nice spread 
between between people's uh, within people's zones of proximal development. So anyway, um, my next steps in this journey is uh, I've re you know in August I left Groupon because um, I, I just I'm really excited about about this sort of stuff um, and in the U.S. Um, you know. It, at least, at least from our point of view, there's critically high un, un and underemployment for people of, who are under age 25. Um, and yet half of the employers in the company, in the country, can't fill roles. Um, so that w w there, there's this thing that we call the skills gap. Lots of demand from employers and yet not, not enough qualified people. I assume this exists in lots of countries. Laurel? Yeah, uh, if I may interject a question here, is yeah. I'd like to know the word the where you're getting the data about uh, the, the, that skills gap. That's one thing that, that's been questioned. Okay. It would be interesting to see where, you know, where, the, where that signal is coming from. Mm -hmm. I can, um, I should have that, <coughs> should have that in my slides, but I will, I'll tweet it. There's, a, there's actually a good report that was turned into a book about it. And it, it was questioning whether there was a skills gap or whether it was, it was, and it was actually more of the fact, like I was alluding to before, that employers need to just be more open. That the skills exist, but they don't ex exist in their, their specific credentials that the employers want to consume. Um, you mean uh, there's a line of mismatch between what um, they're asking for and what they need? Yeah. 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 Yeah
you know, as I was, I'm obviously excited about beginners and people getting over, you know, going from kind of not knowing much to becoming productive uh, teammates. This is kind of the step before I'm going to ship off. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised, and I'm sure maybe things like this have, have existed for a long time, or what well, can be done. Questions? It is not just the U.S. problem, it is right now the problem of everywhere. Yeah, I mean, not all, I mean, actually the companies that come and hire the students aren't necessarily just Ruby shops, but we have to pick one stack, and that's that's a, that's a relatively easy stack for us to, to choose. But a lot of people aren't familiar with Ruby, like this community. Right, so I mean, like, right now, my students that are showing up in April 22nd in Chicago are, are learning Ruby. Like, we've given them two like, uh, materials um, so that by the time they show up, they're already yeah, understand what variables are and things like that. What did you say? Read the Pickaxe book. No, not, don't read the Pickaxe book. <laughs> uh, yeah, read like Chris Pine's learning program book would be a little more appropriate. Are you satisfied with the technology that you chose? Because Ruby and Linux is now, I don't know why you use that map, because it was peak in 2007 and 8, but now it seems to be not majorly used. I can oh, what's not majorly used? Ruby and Rails. Oh no, it's I mean, it's used like crazy. Yeah, I mean, at least in our context, I mean, you don't have to. I mean, if someone say what? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's what we chose. It, it makes sense in our 
context. Um, I, I'm, it's not met yet, but that's just because it made sense because we're trying to meet it on un, unmet demand in the job market. Can people join your workshop? No, it's very co-located. Very, okay. yeah. It's like it's, uh, usually half the students come from outside the the city that it's being held. In. So people travel for it pretty extensively, sometimes internationally. <laughs> Yeah. Do you want to talk more about culture and curriculum? I'd like to. <laughs> Can you ask me specific questions? That might make it easier. Yeah, I mean, so when you say culture, is it like the way that particular, like for example, if you're doing a history program for XYZ company, then by culture you mean the way that company and that development group works? Yeah, and, and how and how, well, what their values are and how they how they interact on a daily basis. I mean, I don't know. We talked a lot about culture at Tivo because we were able to identify what our values were as a company. We want to be role models and things like that. And everything kind of and and, and if, 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 I mean, of course, defining your values doesn't really tell you your culture. So like watching what you actually do is what your culture is. Um, and so, a lot of it was just I mean, a lot of our culture you could see. The learning, like the passion that pretty much we had for learning, and 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 hiring people that shared those same activities and values. Um, yeah, I, I mean, to me, to me, it's it's a it, culture is something you have to, as leaders in the company or leaders in your organization, you have to intentionally cultivate. Um, but it, it's it's definitely kind of a uh, something that that's easy to. Side ever who's who's a hold of or I don't know it's 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 not this like very clear objective thing um, in general. So like, have you seen that you have to let go of people because they're not different culture? Um, yeah, I mean if you're doing you know if you're doing if you're hiring right, you don't necessarily have that problem too often. But yeah, I mean um, the thing that helped us determine whether someone was a good fit or not was generally being able to define our values. <coughs> but basically looking at our culture and defining our values through that and basically being able to say, is this person living up to this value or, or doing something that conflicts with it? That's that was the easiest way for us to solve those sort of problems, which helps the culture. You talked about uh zone of proximity development. Yes. Is it a counter you uh, you know uh, different from uh carrying the juniors with the seniors? So yeah, I mean th th that's a good question. Um, I, I, it basically gets back to the, the point of I mean the mentor needs to be someone who can oversee and like have enough power within the organization to make sure that this this, this apprentice is getting what they need. Um, but like I said, often they, the the mentor isn't the one necessarily pairing with the apprentice all the time. Um, I mean, for someone to be a good mentor, they they generally can go back and be effective in the apprentice's zone. That, that's what makes a great teacher, right? Is somebody who can, even though they're like way out ahead of the student, can come back and like operate and speak in that language that makes sense to the student. Um, so, but just in your kind of normal everyday life, the easiest way for, for you know for, for you to to uh, be operating within your own zone of proximal development, the easiest people to talk to are people just next to you or ahead of you. So I, that, that's why it's important to have a team, right? It's not just like, it's, it can be really difficult if it's just a one-to-one. -one. Uh, like if, if, if you're on a really tiny organization, a really tiny team of just two people, um, that's that's obviously much more difficult than if you have like a team of eight or something, with one mentor, and then like people with that nice spread of competency. Um, that, that's a lot, a lot a lot easier, a lot, a lot more like a living culture of learning. Yeah. So uh, I think what I'm hearing is that uh, mentor is a very a key variable in this equation. Right? Yeah. So typically, often, in often it's the it's kind of the limiting factor. Yeah. So it, it can also be the limiting factor. So in your experience, uh, one question which I have is: in what kind of time commitment typically do you see successful mentors? You know, they need to put in maybe on a weekly basis. Like I said, but, um, <coughs> it, it's a, it's a little bit. Um, front-loaded um, in, 
investment. Okay. The first couple of weeks tend to be pretty intense, um, where you know your your the, the mentor needs to take a little definitely some extra time, probably um, 15 hours out of the first week, maybe. Maybe maybe that's a little heavy. Um, just just taking the time to get get the it, it, part of it is is determined by your onboarding process and how automated that is. Um, but one of the one of the important one of the most intensive things that needs to happen in the first couple of weeks is helping the apprentice determine that what their pet project is, and part of that is an opportunity for the mentor to kind of help them do the ideation and, and the project planning uh, for that project with with the apprentice. So that that definitely takes. And some also time. Your experience, right? But if you would, just to, just to finish, I mean, and then over time it, it evens out where you, you know it's just kind of a more natural, sustainable situation. You're meeting with them for a half hour, hour a week, uh, and they're just kind of much more part of the, the team. And then every two months, there's definitely like a chunk of time, like a few hours that needs to be set aside for those miles of meetings. And, and the other question is, so if I were to compare two mentors, right? In terms of the key skills that a mentor should have, which makes them more successful as compared to the other mentor, what are those key skills in your experience? I mean, I mean, not in terms of maybe their technical expertise, you know, their knowledge of the code and all, but the other stuff. Yeah, it's. I mean, to me, <coughs> I mean, this is something we talk a lot about at depth in camp. They need to have a lot of empathy. They need to be able to put themselves back in their own like beginner years. Um, so does that sort of also mean they should probably also think like a life coach? Essentially, I mean, like that. Those are, that's probably a pretty high correlation between someone who can be a good mentor and somebody who can be a good life coach. Can I give a word to it? Say that. What, can what? I give a word to it? Because that's what I use uh, a word called bendability. Bendability. Yeah. Okay. So it's like instead of having a step change, you have an interchange which is really very smooth. So you take them right from the from from bottom of the ramp up to the top. Like almost like a like an exit or an entry into an interstate highway. So that's that's how I see it. Uh, like a bendable mentor, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, that makes that makes. I mean, kind of like what I was alluding to before, with mentors being able to kind of on the fly exactly. bend to what the the apprentice needs. Um, so I mean, we we kind of put it as we we only allowed our like most senior consultants to do it. It was kind of privileged to be able to take on apprentices, and so that that tended to. Oh, I mean, and, and knowing that meant that when we were hiring more senior people, that that was one of the things we were hiring for, was their interest in helping junior people, which is, as a consultancy, is a really good thing to hire for, because obviously your product is your people, and you can find people to help you develop them. That's a good thing. Would you uh, officially assign mentors to a mentee, or would it be an yeah. organic relationship? No, it's, um, I mean, it depends. Like, the A Flight, which is a consultancy in, in, in Chicago, actually uh, puts the responsibility on the mentor to even find the apprentice in the first place, to recruit them, to hire them. It's pretty much all on the mentor. Um, other companies will have like a normal recruiting hiring process, and then, yeah, at the end of it, there'll be an assignment where, hey, this is your mentor for the next six months. Um, they, they might not be working with you every day, they might not even be on the same project with them week to week, but they're going to be a consistent person meeting with you once a week. And it, yeah, it's a pretty formal thing. Uh, what are the aspects that you look into into an apprentice? You know, uh, when you try to identify whether he's a he or she's a high potential apprentice or not. What um, good, good question. Um, so yeah, high potential, low credential. Or, yeah, the, 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 it's not that they need to have low credentials. It's just not, you, they don't necessarily have the incentive to you know, take this pay cut and do this intense six month program if they have the credentials. But what we look for, um, I mean, the easiest thing to, to look for is are they already coding, right? Like they need to already like if they are not already coding, then they're probably not gonna. There's no excuse, I mean, at least in my my experience, for them not to be coding already. Um, just because, well, first of all, they're not going to be within striking distance of entry level within six months if they're not coding already. Um, but it just speaks to the motivation, right? If I can't go and, and, and see them tweeting or blogging or, or coding or having code somewhere up into open source land, um, 
then they prob they're probably not, they probably don't have the motivation yet or the competency yet to get hired uh, as, an, as an apprentice by us. Um, so we definitely look for, we just, we look for signs of passion, basically, like they can't stop themselves from coding already. Um, that's, I mean, that was, that was true for me as a self-taught software developer. Um, I mean, if you're looking for, you're looking for someone who's basically taking responsibility for their own learning. They, they themselves aren't just going to consume the knowledge that they're going to be pushing themselves forward. Um, the, the ideal candidates are basically people that it's relatively clear to you that they're going to become software developers, whether you try to help them or not. You just help. This is just an opportunity for them to accelerate the process. So yeah, we we just basically look for evidence that they're already up. Maybe they already have some momentum. Any other questions? I really appreciate all the questions and uh, thanks for bearing with me through my, my jet lag. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.